In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, Jesus told the people that his flesh, his flesh was real food and that his blood was true drink. And to eat his flesh and drink his blood meant eternal life. But when many of the disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is really difficult to accept, Jesus. And guess what happened? People stopped following him. So here we are. We're at week five of speaking about bread from the fourth gospel, the gospel of John. And if you recall, Jesus has already fed 5,000 folks. He's taught in an absolutely astonishing way. People don't even know what to think about this man. To say he has gained quite a following is an understatement. Lots and lots of folks are intrigued with him, and they desperately want to be near him. But then Jesus does this crazy thing. He starts talking about eating and drinking him. And the disciples, those who have been following him, not just the twelve, the crowd, it's interesting. The book of John uses the same word for disciples here when they really mean crowd. So these people, the crowd, have literally become Jesus' disciples. They get uncomfortable, though. And they begin to say things like, Jesus, this is sounding really weird, almost like cannibalism. And if I remember correctly, as an observant Jew, there are just some things we can't do, like eat flesh and drink blood. I mean, it's cool and all that you fed us, and you fed us really well. You taught us. You opened up our hearts and our minds to things that we really didn't know before. And then you did this crazy thing. You made us well. You healed us. But this business of eating and drinking you, well, that's carrying it a bit too far. I, I don't think I want to do any of that. So for Jesus to say, I am the bread of life, and that's what we've been hearing the last four weeks. I am the bread of life. This was kosher. That was okay for ears to hear back then. It wasn't scandalous. Again, Jesus was known as a great teacher, and so it wasn't out of the ordinary for him to compare his words to bread, to a kind of spiritual cuisine that could feed your soul. Doesn't that sound lovely? This sounded reasonable. And perhaps those following said, I can go with that, Jesus. Had Jesus stopped there, things might have gone better for him in the sixth chapter of John. But the next thing you know, Jesus says that the bread in question is not his teaching, but his own flesh big difference. Getting a bit more graphic yet, Jesus says that what you needed to wash down his flesh was a cup brimming with some of his blood. This was just too much, not because it was really gross to think about. That in itself is probably reason enough, but it goes so much deeper. And this is where it's a bit helpful to be reminded of something in the nation of Israel's past. Because every single one present that day recalled this. 
those gathered there would have recalled this particular commandment in a heartbeat. For most observant Jews would know this particular teaching from the book of Leviticus. And it says this, For the life of every creature, its blood is life. Therefore, I have said to the people of Israel, this is God speaking, you shall not eat the blood of any creature, for the life of every creature is its blood. And here's the kicker. Whoever eats or drinks of it, guess what happens to them? They are cut off. Imagine the crowd was wondering, um, Jesus, don't you remember this really strong teaching from God? God clearly commands, we cannot do what you are asking us to do. There isn't any wiggle room here, God. It's clear. If blood is consumed, I'm cut off from God. Relationally, it's done. Blood is the life force, and it is only God who can give and take this away. Well, with the crowd still standing around, probably with their jaws opened wide, eyes fixed in disbelief, and probably stomachs churning in opposition to this disgusting request, Jesus then asks this piercing question. Are you offended by what I've said? He really said that. Are you offended by what I've said? Well, we know what happens, and the response was rather immediate. The crowd, his disciples, those who had been enthralled and captivated by what he had been teaching, were no longer gripped. There were no words exchanged, just one collective response. We're out, Jesus. We ain't doing this. This ain't what we signed up for. See you later. And so the crowds left. They deserted Jesus. He was no longer the rock star. Remember, he had to get into boats and sail away because people were clamoring. They wanted to be near him. But now he was all alone. He was no longer what they were looking for. In fact, what he was calling them to do was in their minds absolute blasphemy. And this is where Jesus lost the crowd. Jesus lost them because this teaching was repulsive to them. How could you ask us to do such a thing? But Jesus, knowing full well the only way that these folks would believe what he said would be through his father, Jesus watched as one by one, those in the crowd that had been so eager to follow were now gone. This text is hard, hard on many levels, but there is also a certain level of reality with it as well. On one hand, you have this supposed grotesque ask of Jesus. And then on a more personal level, you have those who just can't. It seems to have cast them to a state of disbelief. They just can't go there. The crowd, they wanted to believe. They had believed. But this was just too much. And so they just give up. And this is where I resonate with the crowd. This is where it gets personal for me. How often have we felt this way? Believing and hoping 
And then when it com- when it seems that this really isn't what I bargained for, Jesus, I wanted and believed life would be better and easier. Gosh, and it just isn't. So I throw my hands up in the air and I say, I've had it. I gave it my best shot, but I give up. I can't do this anymore. And this is where the story challenges me. And this is where I ask if you would go there with me. With just a slight change in perspective, perhaps we can see that at the same time this story has a hefty, hefty dose of disbelief, it also contains something else that might be surprising to some. Because when I read it again, I see a story layered with belief, with courage, and faith. How might you ask, Mother Suzanne, how is that possible with this story? Now this is where I find it. Jesus looked up, and the only ones left were the original disciples. And I wonder if it crossed his mind, well, at least I'm not completely alone. Some Sunday mornings, I come to Grace and I wonder if anybody's going to show up. (laughs) And so Jesus, he turns to his disciples with damp eyes and with a quivering chin looks at them directly and says, are you going to leave me too? Peter's answer is even more poignant than the question. Remember this, dear folks of grace. Lord, to whom else would we go? You are the one that has the words of eternal life. Where else would we go? It's a startling display of true faith. Peter reassures Jesus that he won't leave, not yet. That he is gonna stay in that moment that he is not going to abandon his faith, and he is not going to abandon his belief. And this is where it gets really personal for me. And so I can't help but wonder, today, as so long ago, Jesus still asks all of us, are you going to leave me too? And what I would say in response to that is, please, please, be the disciple who confidently replies in kind, Lord, to whom else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. In that, may we find our hope this day and always.